Okay. Well, Belle and Helen are in their travel boxes and in the car. And now it's uh, Scout's turn. Oh, good. You know, these uh, security lights that you guys sent us has been, have been absolutely wonderful to help light up everything here at our rescue facilities. Give us an opportunity. Okay, let's wake up Scout. Hi, baby boy. There you are. There's my Scout. You ready to get out of bed, huh? Yes, you are. I hear the turkey vulture next door growling. He's not used to me being out here in the dark. So he's not happy. Such a sweet boy. Yeah. That silly turkey vulture. Okay, well, I need to put the phone down. I need both hands so I can get Scout and uh, get moving here. Well, good morning. I'm Martin Tyner, my sweet wife, Susan, and we're ready to go. We're, uh, it's now th uh, three o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the morning, California time. And we're heading for Big Bear to go do one of our wildlife programs. And we're gonna be on the road for the next six hours. And uh, we'll just, uh, just kind of buzz down the freeway and and hopefully have an uneventful drive uh, out to California to do to do our wildlife. Well we are officially out of uh, Arizona. The sign says uh, welcome to Nevada. You just crossed the state line to Nevada and the uh, town of Mesquite, Nevada. Mesquite, Nevada is, is truly a, a desert community. It's extremely hot, extremely dry. It's actually generally a few degrees hotter than Las Vegas. And this is the first place you can gamble. Since they don't really have gambling in the Arizona uh, area along I-15, but uh, here in Mesquite, here in Nevada, there's uh, several casinos uh, in the area and uh, we're doing wonderfully right now our average fuel consumption which I have loved this Subaru for that one of the, those reasons is because it gets wonderful fuel economy uh, so far on the trip we're average, averaging 37.6 uh, miles per gallon now that's a little tiny bit misleading because we've uh, gone from approximately 6,000 feet in elevation to, to now we're at, a, at less than 2,000 feet of elevation. So we've been kind of cruising downhill, but nevertheless the, the, the mileage in this Subaru Forester has just been really exceptional for the size car that it is and how much it carries. I know it's, you can't see from your vantage point, but uh, we're stacked up all the way to the ceiling with, oh no, leave it there, so you don't have to show, with, uh, with not only the, the animal uh, boxes and all of our audio-visual equipment and, and t-shirts and books and everything that we, that we need to not only put on the show, but also to hopefully raise uh, donations for our foundation. So the, the Super Force has been a good little car for us. We've certainly appreciated uh, Finley Subaru and Subaru of America for uh, all of their kindness and generosity. They're one of our corporate sponsors. And so we've been grateful for 
all they've done for the foundation. They've made these wildlife programs possible. It, it is a, a nice feeling to get out again. Uh, this is the first uh, wildlife show that I've done in a year and a half. We uh, just have gotten through, we're mesquite, we're at the uh, west end of it. Uh, next stop will be, or the next community will be uh, Las Vegas. Great thing is with the fuel economy that we get in this car, we'll just uh, blast right past Las Vegas. We won't have to worry about fueling up until uh, we're well into California. So uh, I'll get to talk to you soon. Well, we're at uh, just about in, ready to enter the. Uh, Las Vegas Valley. Once we crest this little hill, you'll, you'll see the city lights of Las Vegas. We've been on the road for two and a half hours, so it's been a pretty much an uneventful drive, just kind of normal for this kind of a situation. Uh, they're starting to see the city lights of Vegas. This is always the worst part of the whole drive, <coughs> is going through downtown Las Vegas. This is where the traffic's the worst. This is where they do you know, a lot of road construction. And if we're going to be delayed, this is this is where it's gonna happen. It's like the time I, I went up and rescued you from Rexburg, Idaho. Yeah, really, where did you get up for that trip? Well, that trip I actually uh, worked all day at Bush Gardens, got off work at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, drove back to Simi Valley, California, where, where we lived, which was about a 45 minute drive, and then I packed up my little Toyota Corolla car and, and took off, I drove all night long. Got to Bountiful, Utah, by about 7, 7.30 in the morning, where I uh, was able to, to meet up with your aunt and uncle, and was going to lay down and, and sleep for a few hours, but I was so excited to, to come and see you, I just I just couldn't sleep, and, and so I got up and got back in my little car, and drove all the way to Rexburg, Idaho. And I, th I think we got to Rexburg, if I remember correctly, it was about midday, it was like one, one o'clock in the afternoon, something like that. Right about lunchtime, yeah. 12, one o'clock, somewhere in there. He says, yeah, I just took a bite of food and I looked out the window and saw you and <laughs> came running out to you with my mouth full. I couldn't hardly say hello, but couldn't contain my joy. And <laughs> into your arms give you a big hug. <laughs> yeah. So uh, got you got you rescued from Rexburg, Idaho from Ricks College. And we drove back to Bountiful, Utah to your uncle and aunt's place where we spent a day or two. And that's where I proposed to you. Because I knew after you being gone for a semester that that just couldn't happen again. I just I just couldn't survive uh, without you that long, so that's uh, that's where we where I proposed to Susan was up in uh, Bountiful, Utah, just to make absolutely certain that she was mine for for the rest of my life. And I'm so grateful that she's put up with me for so long. Again, this is Las Vegas. Uh, it's not my kind of town, but I do come down here quite frequently doing my wildlife programs as we can, and hopefully we'll just uh, slide right through Vegas. And I did stop in uh, Barstow probably for breakfast. So, so far so good. We're, we're at the halfway point of uh, 
may, may get it to, to Big Bear, California. We'll talk to you guys in a little bit in a bit. Well, as you can probably see, the we're starting to see a little bit of blue sky and clouds and daylight, and we're just the sun's still a ways from being, from rising, but uh, it's a, a nice kind of an overclass cloudy day, which is really good. Otherwise, it gets very very hot out here in the desert. We're uh, we're in California now. We're about a half an hour away from Baker, California, and about an hour away from Barstow. And Barstow is kind of where we go to uh, make the turn to go up to uh, the San Bernardino Mountains up to Big Bear. So we're just kind of putting along the open desert and just uh, relax. It's been a, a, a very mild drive so far. Traffic has not been too bad. It's getting a little heavier now as we're starting to get uh, deeper into California. One of the things that we noticed is uh, this is a Saturday morning and you end up with more traffic heading from Los Angeles to Las Vegas for the weekend. And then on Sunday, the traffic's heading back to to Los Angeles and so um, today it'll be northbound will be the the crowdest tomorrow it will be southbound and so we're going just the opposite which means that we should be just fine as far as uh, traffic is concerned so anyway this is just uh, across the Mojave Desert in California and we'll talk to you later Well, we're just about to approach the highlight of our uh, trip down I-15 from Las Vegas uh, to California, or to, into California. And the highlight of the whole whole drive is the, the town of Baker, California. Yeah, Susan's laughing. She knows what I'm going to say. Uh, Baker, Nevada, Baker, California boasts having the largest thermometer in the world. And so we're just approaching that now. I can I can see it off in the distance. I don't know if you can quite see it yet, but one thing us kids used to do when we would uh, go up and down I-15 is uh, who could spot the giant thermometer first. Uh, on a two-lane road to 
Big Bear. This is still cutting across the high desert, but in another half hour we should be starting to climb up the mountains and get up to the Big Bear Lake area. So we're we're only about an hour away from our destination, so we're, our timing's real good. It's nice that uh, traffic was so so slow that we didn't have any issues. Well, welcome to uh, Big Bear, California, and uh, here's our cabin that we're going to stay in for the night. And we're right across from the swimming pool, and you know, just lots and lots of big pine trees in the area. So this is our this is our place for the night to uh, bring in the birds and get a good night's sleep before we head back to Utah. Let me kind of show you around a little bit the cabin they were staying in. Um, Mary brought us a a basket of treats and goodies and uh, a thank you card and something. No idea what this is, but we'll look at that in a little bit. And it's just a, a rustic type cabin that has uh, been around for probably a hundred years. A little kitchen we have here as well. And again, the uh, the truth of the matter is, with the birds, if if this couch would fold out as a bed, this would be this room is all I need for taking care of things. But the has a a spa and the uh, bedrooms are upstairs. And so we've got basically uh, two beds in this bedroom and uh, again two beds in this bedroom as well. We don't need that many, many obviously for Susan and I. One bed is quite sufficient. Yeah, but it's, uh, they got us way more than we needed. They're very nice. So anyway, that's uh that's our room for the night. Uh, fancier digs and that we certainly need or are used to using. But like I said, they've done everything uh, to roll up the red carpet for us to um, treat us like we're somebody special. That's that's an odd feeling, but. Uh, we do, we do appreciate all, all of the kindness, and uh, we'll need and to get over here. Mary and, and Teresa, I think those are the women yeah. kind of. Do you want to look at this? this on, yep. Card. A nice basket. Let's look at the card and see what it says. Life is crammed with things to take care of, and still you made time to show you care. That means everything. Thanks. Oh, that's uh, very sweet. Martin and Susan, thank you for everything that you do to take care of all of our friends and relatives. And of course, for us and our well-being, you are both so very special. Love, Jackie and Shadow. So, a gift basket from Jackie and Shadow, the bald eagles that nest here. Oh, that's wonderful. This is, well, it's Roadrunner. Looks like it's hanging um, chimes. Oh, okay. Little wind chimes. Yeah, wind chimes. In the shape of a Roadrunner. In the shape of a Roadrunner, so. Oh, cool. That's very, I'm very sweet of them. This probably goes up above. But don't, yeah. Nope. Or nope. down. Anyhow, We want to yeah. go back in the box. So yes, nope. we want to keep it back in the box, but that's really cool. 
And then like, like I said, just a whole basket full of goodies to for our trip home. And we'll... Nuts and fruits and yeah. cheeses and crackers and That's water, pineapple, kind. raspberries. You want to put some of that in the refrigerator yeah. soon? Yeah. So we can take so some, we can... some of it in our ice box to go over to the convention hall and uh -huh. some of it here. That would be awesome. Okay. Wow. Big basket. Yeah. Well, take what you want with us. We need to go and yep. get things set up. Yep, we'll get set up. Sounds good. Okay, thank you. All right. I really appreciate you guys. Yeah. We'll get packed up and head over. Well, welcome to Big Bear, California, and uh, this is where we're going to be doing our program. Uh, I, I would say this is kind of a nostalgic situation for Susan and I. This is the the place that we uh, had our honeymoon, but that was 43 years ago, and to be honest with you, none of it looks the same. <laughs> it's all different. It's all different. Uh, I don't recognize any of it. So, I think the the Big Bear, California that I remember was like maybe uh, kind of the main street, a couple of business streets on either side of Main Street, and then and then dirt dirt roads leading up and through the woods to cabins. Well, I think we're on Big Bear Boulevard right now, which was probably the main street then. Yes. So we're heading to the convention center. We went and got checked into the cabins. And the uh, convention center is just a uh, mile up the road from where we are. Uh, down at the dry end of the lake. So anyway, uh, it's... There used to be water in the lake here when you were a kid though, huh? You, you know, again, we're talking 50 years ago, I, I don't remember. I really don't. Remember how high the water was 50 years ago, but it is. It's nice to be here. We're uh, gonna be at the convention center in, in a minute or two, and then we'll uh, start hauling stuff in and getting set up for the show. I was hoping to start setting in a up. Quarter mile. Turn left onto Division Drive. Okay. Was hoping to get set up. Or start setting up the shows at 11 wanted to start set up at 9 which gives us a couple of hours to work out any bugs to make sure that everything is okay with uh, with whatever the venue has versus uh, my equipment and so we can use the turn left onto division drive then turn left we can use the conference centers uh, audio visual equipment but I brought all of mine as well, so if theirs isn't compatible, then, I, then I'll just use turn my left, stuff. Turn left, then turn left. And turn left and turn left. So here we are. This is the convention center. And we will... He told us we could pull right into the gate. Yep. So we can unload. Your destination is on the right. Anyway, we are here. They've, they've turned my my bird, bird of Prey program into a, an event. And so it's going to be more than just us. It looks like we've got yeah, people so, setting up. Yeah, and well, we'll see what's try to going get on inside. Try to get around and see what we can do here. Alrighty. Okay. Well, We'll start setting up. My pretty girl. This is my lady. This is my pretty lady. We're going to have to walk around a little bit. She will put them on the floor, but we just wipe that off with a paper towel. And so, we'll, yes, there's my girl. Then her name is Helen. She's a peregrine falcon. Uh, the peregrine falcon is very, very important to all of us. They saved our lives. Did you guys know that? The peregrine falcon and the bald eagle saved our lives. And the reason they saved our lives is because they told us that we were doing something really stupid. 
in the late 1960s, this beautiful falcon, the population crashed. It went down hard. The peregrine falcon became an endangered species. There was only thought to be about four dozen pairs of falcons like this left in the wild of the Anatomy Peregrine. So falcons such as myself, we brought all of our peregrines together. We created a breeding project called the Peregrine Fund, and we have raised tens of thousands of peregrine falcons, and we have returned them back to the wild. The peregrine falcon is the first animal to be removed from the endangered species list. We have saved the peregrine falcon. Now what happened? What happened to the peregrine falcon? Well, what happened was a chemical called DDT. Now, I grew up in CD Valley. Most of you guys know where that is. Okay. I, I grew up, when I was a little kid in CD Valley, CD Valley was 4,000 people. I grew up in the middle of North Grove. It was a wonderful place to live. And because I grew up in the middle of North Grove, uh, us kids, we'd play in the North Groves, which is just fine. And the farmers would go through with their spray trucks and they'd spray the trees with DDT, killing the insects that would damage their crops. Now, DDT was safe. We all know it was safe. In fact, DDT was so safe that I remember the, at, at the community swimming pool, I remember them having sprayers spraying us kids at the swimming pool with DDT to kill the mosquito larvae in, in the pool. That could probably explain a lot about me. <laughs> well, all of a sudden, the peregrine falcon population crashed and went down big time. And what we discovered was the reason the population went down is because they're at the top of the food chain. And so what happened was that they'd spray the trees, they'd spray uh, irrigation areas for mosquitoes and all sorts of things, and then birds would eat the insects would get sick, and birds would eat the sick insects that had been contaminated with DDT. And the higher up the food chain, the more concentrated the DDT got. And so they're at the top of the food chain, we're at the top of the food chain. What kills them kills us. It just kills them faster because they're smaller. Does that make sense to everybody? And so when we started to lose the peregrine falcon, they were the canary in the coal mine for us. They helped us realize that DDT was preventing them from assimilating calcium, and they couldn't lay strong enough eggs, they couldn't hatch the eggs, and the population was crashing, and we were losing them fast. If we would have continued to use DDT as we were, my children and my grandchildren would have been born with severe birth defects. The peregrine falcon saved us. The bald eagle was equally affected with DDT. The brown pelican as well. This is why I do what I do. Because these guys are the barometers that help us understand how our environment is working. And if all of a sudden something's going wrong, and we either get a large population or we lose a population, that something's changing the environment, and if it's something's changing the environment, it will affect us as humans. That's why we protect it. This is the question and answer time. Do you have questions about peregrine falcons I can answer for anybody before I bring up my walk? No questions about? Yeah, so this is my sweet little bell. Here's my girl. Now the Harris hawk, as I said, there's a slight reservation very unique. Southern Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, one of the only birds in the world that hunts in a pack like wolves. So you, so if you ever get down into Southern Arizona and you see a hawk like this in a powerful park, get out your binoculars because when you see one hair hawk, you're going to see two, three, four, five hair hawk. They're going to be a family. And if you've got a little time, just watch. And they'll set up their hunt. They are so intelligent that what will happen is instead of uh, positions around the field, up on power poles and trees and so on, and then one hawk will fly down and chase out a rabbit, 
and the other hawks come from different directions, all going down to the same rabbit. And so they work as a team, which is just an amazing opportunity. Now, you can see the hawk is built very, very different from the falcon. First of all, look at the color of the hawk's eyes. They're brown. Falcons have black eyes. All falcons, black eyes. Now, hawks can have brown eyes, blue eyes, gray eyes, orange eyes, yellow eyes, red eyes, but all falcons have black eyes. And, she, and the Harris hawk has her brown eyes. The hawk is built very differently. Where the falcon has long slender wings to a point, the hawk has thick, broad, rounded wings. And so this is more of a sprint bird. This is not a bird that flies at great altitude. This bird relies on a speed and agility that just downright high speed suits. And so this is a bird that catches most of its quarry on the ground. And so in order to do that, where the falcon has the shorter legs, the hawk has much, much longer legs so it can reach through the bushes to grab the small animals and birds that it hunts. And look at the feet. The length of the toes between the hawk and falcon are very similar, but look how thick and powerful they are. Because she doesn't hit a, a, an animal at high speed, breaking its back and neck or wings, she basically crushes with those feet. She can, she can take a, an animal four times her size. You know, she catches, she's caught eight pound jackrabbits, and this is a two pound hawk. And, and so, with the strength of those feet, they're capable of doing that. Look at that beautiful tail. Where the falcon's tail is much smaller and stiffer, yeah, let me show you how to build your tail on this feet. Look, yes, I am. I'm going to play with the tail. Yes, you are. <laughs> See, this is my tail. But it, it's, it's highly maneuverable, very, very, very flexible. That's the rudder that she uses to steer. Yes, it is, huh? Yes, that's my baby girl. And so she came out of a captive breeding program. She's not from the wild. And, and she is one of my personal falconry birds and one of my wildlife ambassadors. And the nice thing about her is on a good year, she catches between 80 and 100 jackrabbits a year. And that's food for the injured wildlife to be careful. And, and so the farmers like it because jackrabbits can be quite the pest for the farmers. And uh, it provides a really good food source, natural food source, for the wildlife that we rescue. How long do they live for? On average, a hawk like this in the wild will live uh, about seven to 10 years. Now in captivity, we can double that because the wild is a tough place to make a living. And so we can, we can go 50 to 20 years. My last Harris hawk uh, passed away at 29 years. So again, because we can care for them and guarantee them food and give them, guarantee them shelter and everything, she doesn't, they don't uh, suffer as badly in the wild as, as I know to, as the wild ones do. So, yeah, she's such a good girl. Let's go over here and grab a book. Okay. Now, like I said, I've been doing this a long time, and when I lived in Simi Valley, I, I had a Harris Hawk just like this one, you know, 40, 50 years ago. And, she, and her name was Sierra, but she had a bit of a sad story. She had been stolen her, from her nest by some teenage kids. Now, a hawk, an eagle, a falcon, an owl, a bird prey raised by man has no fear of man. And that makes them extremely dangerous. Because they have no fear of man, if they get mad at you for any reason, they will hurt you. Well, I have this female Harris hawk raised by these teenage boys, raised inappropriately. She was imprinted. She was dangerous. She was horribly abused. She ended up with a broken leg. That's when she came to me because I'm the guy that rescues the critters. Well, I could fix her broken leg, but I could not fix the emotional scars that she carried with her for the rest of her life. This bird was so emotionally disturbed, its favorite thing to hunt was cows. Cows. We would go out on the desert, and if there's a cow within a mile, she had to go beat up a cow. 
She attacked horses. She attacked joggers. She attacked a farmer on his tractor. Okay, she had issues. Needless to say, we could not put her back in the wild. She was dangerous. So she stayed with me for the rest of her life as, as one of my falconry birds and one of my wildlife ambassadors. And we got along wonderfully together. We were good friends. Well, back in Simi Valley when I was a kid, um, everybody had a really bad habit in Simi Valley because everybody knew everybody. And everybody would leave the keys of their cars on the floor of their cars. And so, leaving the keys on the floor of the cars, you call up your buddy and say, hey, can I borrow your car? And your buddy says, sure, the keys are on the floor. And I did the same thing. That's when I was a teenager. We didn't think about that much. Well, one day I was, my hawk and I were coming back from a little hunting trip. We'd been out in the fields, let her chase rabbits. And I stopped at the local gas station to buy me something to drink. And so I walked into the store to go buy a soda pop. And as I came walking out of the store, I heard screaming. And I saw a guy bailing out of my car. So I'm running across the parking lot, and I get to my car, and my hawk is on the ground next to my car. So I pick up my hawk, I put her back on the perch, she just sit on the perch in the back seat of the car. That's how we transport her out to the fields. And after I put her on her perch, I noticed that my keys to the car were picked up off the floor. They were put in the ignition. He tried to steal my car. Now, I don't know if he saw the hawk, did see the hawk, saw the hawk and thought of the stuff. I have no idea what was going through his mind. But can you guys imagine? You get into a strange car. You grab the keys off the floor, you put them in ignition, and then you have eight razor sharp talons puncturing the back of your neck, wings beating and the most awful growl you've ever heard. Harris Hawk's growl. Yes, you do. <laughs> That's my group. Yes. There were quarter-sized drops of blood going down the street. I know he needed stitches. Going to assume that's the last car he ever tried to steal. My hawk got the, the nickname, my feathered Doberman Pitcher. Well, like I said, I've been rescuing these guys for a very, very long time. I've been doing this over 50 years. And my sweet wife, Susan, who's sitting right over there, uh, this last February, we celebrated our 43rd wedding anniversary. Isn't that amazing? She's put up with me for 43 years. Well, our very first date, I took her hunting with that hawk. <laughs> I'm a romantic kind of a guy. So we get out to the field. I get my hawk out of the car, under my glove, and as my then girlfriend, but now wife, approached, my hawk turned around and faced her and growled violently at her. <laughs> then my hawk turned back around towards me and faced me lifted her tail, and pooped on her. <laughs> that was our first date. She married me anyway, it's her fault. Well, Susan and I have written a book. If you like animal stories, the book is called Healer of Angels. Uh, this is my golden eagle, you'll get to meet him in just a minute. And uh, my golden eagle has autographed my book, that's his footprint. It's the only book in the world autographed by a wild eagle. And if you like animal stories, this is 40 years of wildlife rescue stories and the wisdom of grandparents. And in the process of writing our book, I told my wife Susan, I said, we need to put the story of my old Harris Hawk in the book, Old Sierra. And, uh, my wife Susan says, well, if you're going to tell everybody about our first date, 
you need to tell everybody about the rest of our first date. And I says, no, the story's funnier, right? And the story where you get pooped on. <laughs> and she says, no, you have to tell everybody about the rest of our first date. And I says, well, Susan, if you want to tell everybody about the rest of our first date, you have to write the story. So she did. And so if you want to learn about why this sweet, beautiful young lady had married me, you got to read the book. And we do have some here if anybody would like. Questions about Hawks that I can answer for anyone. Yes. Yes. Now this is, is a 18 year old fully adult golden eagle. And his name is Scout. A farmer up in Wyoming was threatening to shoot him. And I was called by the federal government to rescue him before he got shot. So he is full grown and wild when, when we trapped him. And let's start from the bottom, big guy. Shall we work our way up? Show everybody how pretty you are. First thing you should look at is these feet. Okay, 600 pounds per square inch of crushing power of those feet. He could drive those talons through my glove and crush the bones in my hand. It's really good he likes me. We do appreciate that. Show these folks your pretty feet too. Truly amazing. Now, my eagle has over 7,000 feathers. Now, there are many native people around the world that believe that if you say your prayers with an eagle feather, the eagle feather will carry your prayers to God. I've got over 7,000 of them. I'm in really good shape. All 7,000 feathers weigh approximately two pounds of weight. So they're very light. Now the bone structure, yeah, you're gonna do that. The bone structure of birds, their bones are hollow. And so his entire skeletal structure, again, is only about two pounds of weight. Yet there's a portion of my eagle's body that represents about half his body weight. And that's the two large chest muscles right here, the pectoral muscles. And those two large muscles are the motors that he uses to drive that six foot wingspan that allows eagles to fly where hawks and falcons cannot. For eagles like this have been spotted at altitudes greater than 30,000 feet. And this eagle can comfortably soar in a 40 mile an hour wind, which would ground a hawk or a falcon. And of course, the eyesight of an eagle is legendary. Here is an eight pound creature, an eight pound creature with eyes larger than yours. Not only is his eyes larger, he has six times the number of light sense himself in the back of the eye that you have. And so everything he sees is six times clearer. This eagle can spot a jackrabbit five miles away. And he does. For he and I go out of the desert, north of town, all of this comes off, he flies free. He goes thousands of feet in the sky. He flies with the wild eagles. And I look upon the ledge on the north side of town, and I see two eagles soaring, three eagles soaring out there, and I'm going, well, I think that's my eagle. But it's a little hard to tell because they're so far away. And you'll always have to wonder what they're talking about. To see my eagle cruising with his friends, I can see my eagle looking over at his buddies and say, watch this, I have a trained human. <laughs> All I have to do is drift out over that guy's head and he'll run out to the desert with a stick, hitting bushes, flushing out rabbits for me to catch. <laughs> and I will. And, and if he doesn't catch a rabbit, he knows that all he has to do is fly back and land on my glove, I'll feed him anyway. Why would you watch the road? I will watch the road, I promise. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, uh, good morning, good evening. Uh, I'm Martin Tyner with the Southwest Wildlife Foundation, and 
we are, it is now 1139, uh, and we are on the road. We've just left uh, Big Bear, California from our program that we did up at the convention center in Big Bear, and we're just starting the, the windy roads, and uh, warnings, warning signs just says, watch downhill speeds speeds of 25 miles an hour so this is a, a really windy part <clears throat> but it is paved and the weather is good so we'll be just fine uh, really wanted to thank everybody at Big Bear I was uh, overwhelmed with with everyone's kindness and friendship and love of uh, wildlife especially uh, the eagle the pair of bald eagles we have here at Big Bear uh, we Jackie had, and Shadow yeah, Jackie and Shadow. So it was uh, it was a great time. Uh, a lot of you are going to wonder, you know, why didn't we just stay in the motel and sleep in? And the truth of the matter is, uh, we do need to get back home. And we did uh, sleep a few hours. Yes, we did a few hours. But we need to get we need to get back home and, and take care of the critters. Uh, so we can't stay away very long. Uh, which this means that we'll probably be able to get back. Uh, to Cedar City between six and seven o'clock in the morning, and, and get everybody settled and fed and watered and cared for. So we're be nice to get back home. But mostly, uh, this was was such a fun experience. Uh, everybody, like I said, was so kind. They really seemed to enjoy the show. Uh, we made a a whole bunch of new friends that that people have been watching us for. Uh, for I guess years watching our YouTube channel uh, came up it was uh, it was actually quite fun for people to come up and, and say you know they they watched us um, as we uh, talked all the way from Enoch Utah to Big Bear California we did little posts on the way as to where we are going and what's what we're seeing and what's going on and they were they they followed us. It was uh, almost it reminded me of like when we were little kids, and you you watch the NORAD reports on Santa Claus. <laughs> it's, that's that's the closest thing I can think of. Is 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 oh he's at this location now, and and, and people were people were just tremendously wonderful. Uh, we we got some uh, special gifts. Uh, uh, that people brought up for us when they found out that we were going to be in the area. And, and so it was uh, just a, an amazing experience. You guys are, are wonderful. Uh, I can't tell you how much we appreciate all, all the love and kindness uh, that you sh showed to us. Uh, I hope the... Uh, the motel with the cabins uh, don't mind that we were we were only in the cabin for just a very few hours because we had we, had, we got a little bit of sleep and now we're back on the road well as I always say Martin's bar and sour he heads for home and he just keeps on going but you know what <laughs> I'm that way too we both like to go home we're home bodies we're happy there and happy together and that's where the, the birds are happy but everybody was so, so nice. Really, uh, genuinely kind. Uh, it, it just almost felt like a family reunion. Uh, everybody just came up and what, what, a, what a tremendous experience. Uh, we had uh, several people uh, from what they call Down the Hill, which is uh, from the Los Angeles area. That came up to uh, to Big Bear to, to see us, and, and so, like I said, it was just tr just tremendous fun. Uh, they've asked me again already, you know, would I please come back? They would like to make this an annual event, and I I, I told them I says, well, I'd be happy to come back, but you know, people are going to get bored with us. You know, they may want to consider you know having having us come up about you know every you know, three or four years so that this isn't uh, 
uh, a boring show for them, but they they <laughs> they said no, they don't want to wait that long. And so uh, we'll we'll see how the schedule works out and possibly come back and do a program next year for them as well. And thanks the Wyatts for uh, hosting us. That was so incredible of them to, to host us at the convention center there in Big Bear. Um, that was very, very kind. Now, now they were the, one that, the ones that fed us? Yeah, and thanks. Mary was going to feed us, and, the, and then I, the Wyatts picked it up since they got it. So anyway, folks, uh, thank you so very, very much for, for putting up with us and being so hospitable and so kind. The, uh, the, the people of Big Bear... Uh, just thank you. Uh, you guys made our visit uh, truly wonderful. Um, and and I'll get back to concentrating uh, on my driving here because it's this is kind of the really windiest part of the road. And hopefully we'll we'll talk to you guys soon. Hello. So we made it safely back to Enoch. Just got off the freeway. It's uh, 6:22 this morning, Sunday morning. So uh, we got just a, a few hours sleep last night and then we woke up and decided to head for home. We're homebodies, but we love it. <laughs> and the critters are happier there. So Scout and Belle and, and Helen will be happy to get home and have their food at home. They, they didn't eat. Martin offered them food and held them yesterday after the programs, but they like being home better too. So. Just want to let everybody know we're home safe and thank you so much for caring about us and uh, for how good you were to us. We'll talk to you later. Bye bye.